We were driving cross country when we entered a tunnel. Do not try to find it. My wife Mia and I were driving cross country. It was our first attempt at the Great American Road Trip. Mia and I rented a small RV, more of a camper than a full-blown RV. We packed up a couple suitcases with plenty of room for any souvenirs and we hit the dusty trail. We started our journey on the Mother Road, Route 66, driving south from Chicago until we connected to I-70 and shot straight west through Missouri. The goal was to see those parts of the country we had never seen before, stopping anywhere that seemed interesting, from the plains of Kansas up through the badlands of Wyoming and South Dakota. In Missouri, we saw the world's largest cap gun. In Kansas, we visited the Evil Knievel Museum and the world's largest belt buckle. We love all those kitschy tourist trap places. Eventually, we made it to Colorado, and after a few hours more of driving through amber waves of grain, we saw them. The Rocky Mountains. We made an exit and headed north through the winding mountain highways. The Rockies were gorgeous. Snow-capped in the middle of summer, some of the peaks pierced through the white fluffy clouds. We saw a sign that read, Traffic Tunnel, 3 miles. A little further and sure enough, there it was. A large tunnel bored directly through the mountain in front of us. A large sign read, Pike Tunnel, longest traffic tunnel in the nation. Please turn your headlights on now. How long is it? Asked Mia. <laughs> That's what she said. I quipped. But she was right. There was no information beyond the detail that this was the longest tunnel in the nation. Can't be more than a mile or two. I said as I watched the little white car ahead of us slip into the darkness. A moment later, we joined it. The tunnel was lit by fluorescence that gave everything a greenish-yellow tinge. On the left-hand side was a raised walkway behind a railing for maintenance access. Initially, I was struck by the incredible amount of work that went into the construction of this man-made marvel. We're under a million tons of Rocky Mountain right now, I said. How many years before this caves in? Mia responded. I shot her a look. Let's save the cave in talk until we're out on the other side. I'm just saying, nature will take this back eventually, she continued. I scanned the empty road ahead of us. Where did the other car go? I asked. We were now alone in the tunnel. No cars ahead of us, nor behind us. Huh. They must have sped off ahead. Maybe they're scared of a cave-in? My Spotify playlist had stopped playing. Mia looked at the phone. No cell service. She turned on the radio and spun the dial only to find static. You're not going to be able to pick up a station in here, I said. She turned the volume down. I just wanted to check. If only we had some CDs. This tunnel really keeps going. I would have thought we'd be through it by now, I replied. I looked at the RV's odometer. 45,600 miles. I picked up speed. I wanted to try and catch up to the little white car. Up until this point, the tunnel was a straight shot, but now the tunnel started to curve to the right. It may have been my imagination, but it also felt as though we were descending. Mia felt it too, and she started to get antsy. Where did that other car go? How long is this tunnel? There was an urgency in her voice. I was getting nervous. Claustrophobia was not usually a problem for me, but when I looked down at the odometer and I saw that it had gone up by three miles, my mind began to wander to unsettling places. We were descending in altitude. I could feel it. I could see a slope in the lights on the ceiling and the railing of the maintenance walkway. I could feel a pressure in my head. And I was getting cold. Could you grab me a coat from the back, Mia? I couldn't have Mia getting anxious. That would only start a chain reaction and make me freak out, which would then make her freak out. She unbuckled and ducked into the back of the RV to where we had a cooler stocked with drinks and food. Just as she stepped into the back, I saw something. There, standing on the side of the road, was a man wearing a reflective safety vest and a hard hat. He was waving to me as I passed him by. Something about him looked... strange. I watched him in the side view mirror as we passed and he was still watching the RV, still waving at the back of our vehicle as he faded into the distance. Mia reappeared from the back of the RV, coke in hand. She popped it and handed it to me. You look worried. I'm fine. I smiled and took a sip of the coke. 
Eric, slow down! I slammed on the brakes as I saw what made me a scream. In the road in front of us was a roadblock. Two reflective traffic sawhorses blocked both lanes of the tunnel. Beyond the roadblock, the lights of the tunnel were dark. There was nothing but a void of blackness. Standing in front of the roadblock was another man wearing a reflective vest and a hard hat. Only this time his hard hat had a light on top which obscured his face. We came to a jolting stop. I turned to Mia. Are you okay? I asked. I'm fine. She replied. It's a cave-in, isn't it? Oh god, I hope not. I rolled down the window, leaned out, and yelled to the man in the hard hat. Hey, what's going on? The man was about five yards away. He took two steps towards us and then raised a hand to his mouth and yelled. Just doing some maintenance. How long is it going to take? I yelled back. The man made a hand gesture as if he didn't hear me. How long is it going to take? I called again. He made the same gesture. I unbuckled my seatbelt and grabbed the door release. What are you doing? Mia asked. I, I gotta know what's going on. Eric, just stay here. It, it might not be safe. I'll be just a second, I said. I pushed the door open and stepped down from the RV. Stay in your vehicle, the man yelled. He took a couple steps towards me with his hand out, telling me to stop. What's the hold up? I shouted. The man was a bit closer now, but I still couldn't see his face through the shining light on his helmet. Please stay in your vehicle, he shouted. There was something off about it. Then I heard it. A scream or something rolled from deep in the tunnel. The worker turned and looked into the darkness. Then he ran past the barricades, and soon all we could see of him was the light on his helmet. The light disappeared a moment later. What the hell was that? I is someone hurt? Mia asked. I, I have no idea, I said. Should we do something? Mia asked. I just sat there and watched the pitch black tunnel in front of me. I had no idea what to tell her. I checked the side view mirrors. There was still nobody behind us. Where are the other cars? I asked. They must have gotten through before the roadblock. Or maybe they caused the roadblock. Mia replied. I, I saw another worker a little ways back. We could try to go back and talk to him. We'd be going straight into any oncoming cars. Uh, th there's a maintenance walkway. We, we didn't pass him that long ago. We can probably catch him on foot. Maybe we should just wait for the guy to come back. She reached over and grabbed my arm. I squeezed her hand. She was right. I looked out to the tunnel ahead of us. I turned on the RV's high beams, but all I could see beyond the roadblock was more tunnel and more road. I checked my phone. Unsurprisingly, there was no surface still. We waited, but the man never came back. It's been 20 minutes, Mia said. How come there hasn't been another car behind us? I was having the same thought. I rolled down my window and stuck my head out. I looked back at the road behind us. It went back about 200 yards before curving out of sight. There was no sign of that first worker I saw on the maintenance walkway. I looked at the roadblock ahead of us and clicked on the RV's high beams. There was nothing beyond the roadblock but more tunnel. It didn't look like it was under construction. Just very dark. I think we should keep going, I said. What about the roadblock? We'll move those sawhorses out of the way and just drive past, I said as I opened my door. Mia looked at me, then she cast her eyes at the dark tunnel ahead of us. I knew she was processing the same limited options that I was. Driving backwards would be a huge risk in the instance of another car finally coming along. Getting out and walking would take god knows how long. We could have driven ten miles at this point. Forward was our best option. Let's do it, Mia said. We jumped out and quickly pulled the two sawhorses out of the right lane. I pulled the RV up past the barriers, then we jumped out again and put the sawhorses back where they were. We didn't need another car to come barreling through. We were finally moving again. Slowly. It was pitch black save for the high beams of the RV. We crept forward at around 15 miles per hour. As the tunnel turned and twisted, my eyes started to play tricks on me. I kept seeing shapes at the furthest point of the tunnel. I kept seeing something standing just at the end of the next bend. But as we rolled forward, and there was nothing there. 
Where are the workers? Mia asked. I, I don't know. I was done rationalizing. This was all wrong. Traffic tunnels are never this long. My mind started to wander to all the road trip urban legends I'd read about. The killer in the back seat, the disappearing gas station, the pale man in the cornfield. Did we stumble into some strange outlier location? An in-between point on the endless roads that cross this country? Then I saw it. Look! A person! Thank God. Mia shouted. As we rounded a curve in the tunnel, a group of maintenance workers entered our view. The three of them stood on the left side of the road behind two more sawhorses topped with flashing lights. Two of them faced towards us. The third was facing the other two. The one with his back to us wore a light on his hard hat. Was this the same guy we saw earlier? How did he get this far away? I approached slowly and rolled down the window. Hey, you left us waiting back there, I yelled. There was no response. In fact, all three men were completely silent, and it was hard to tell in the flashing light of the sawhorses, but they looked to be standing completely still. Hello, I yelled again. I pushed open my door and stepped out to the pavement. Eric, wait. I, I held up a finger to Mia. Just a second. I slowly stepped towards the three men. Hello? No response. What the fuck? The bright lights of the sawhorses obscured their faces. I kept moving closer. Hey, what's going on? Then I saw it. Their faces. They were plastic. In front of me stood three mannequins. I backed away toward the RV. Then I turned and walked hurriedly to the vehicle. I was seriously freaked out, but I didn't want to alarm Mia. I climbed into the driver's seat and slammed the door shut. They're mannequins, I said. What? They're mannequins. Why? What? I, I, I don't know. I looked back over at the three figures and my blood ran cold. The hard hat mannequin had somehow turned around to face us. All three figures appeared to be watching us now. Then we heard it. A loud, resonant banging on the side, and then the roof of the RV. What the hell was that? Mia whispered. We listened, holding our breath. Then, a shuffling sound. Something was moving on, or in, the RV. Stay here, I said. I got up. Eric, wait! I moved to the back of the RV. It was dark. I went for a drawer in the kitchenette space and pulled out a flashlight. I moved to the rear of the RV, the bedroom. My flashlight illuminated an empty room. Whoever is back here, I have a gun. A shitty bluff, but I didn't see anything. I shone the light out of the windows of each side of the RV. Nothing. Then I heard it. A shuffling sound from right above me. I looked up and screamed, FUCK! On the roof of the RV. Staring through the skylight was a woman with vacuous black eyes and a dead smile. Her stringy black hair dangled down towards me, casting thin black shadows across her horrible pale face. Mia, drive! Fast! I screamed. Mia jumped over to the driver's seat, shifted into gear, then stomped on the gas. The RV was clunky, but it could move when it needed to. We lurched forward and I fell back. I trained my flashlight up onto the skylight again, and the woman was gone. I scrambled to my feet and looked out of the side windows. Did Mia shake her off? There was no sign of the woman. I moved to the passenger seat, breathing heavily and sweating. What happened? She asked, keeping the RV at a steady 50 miles per hour. There was a woman on the roof, I said flatly. I realized now that I was in a kind of shock. A woman? Her eyes were black. Mia just looked at me, then back at the tunnel ahead of us. There's something wrong with this tunnel, I whispered. Mia pointed at the road ahead. Look. I looked out at the tunnel. There were more mannequins. A lot more mannequins. They were positioned on both sides of the road. They were all facing us, and even though I never saw them move, when I looked in the side view mirror, they were somehow still facing us, turning to watch us as we drove past, watching without eyes. Just keep driving, I said. 
As we drove on, the mannequins crowded the sides of the road more and more. There were thousands of them. Eventually, they were so close that some of their outstretched arms hit the side of the RV. They were closing in on us, squeezing our path forward. One stood in the middle of the road. I don't think I can get around it. Run it over. Don't stop. The RV smashed into the mannequin. Its head shot forward and bounced against the windshield, and the vehicle shuddered as it rolled over the body. Soon there were two in the road. Then three. I could see where this was going. Pretty soon there would be too many for the RV to ram through. But God damn it, we were going to get through as many as we could. Speed up, Mia. The sound was surreal. Smashing into mannequin after mannequin at nearly 60 miles per hour. Hands, legs, heads, and torsos flew. The windshield cracked, the RV shuddered and screamed and eventually slowed down, despite the screaming engine. I'm certain the axle was jammed up with lifeless plastic body parts. Eventually we came to a stop. She won't move, Mia said. She pressed on the gas, but it was no use. The RV just rocked a little bit. Try reverse. She shifted and pressed on the gas. We got some decent movement before running into another jam. Fuck! Should we get out and look? Mia asked. I'll go. I said as I grabbed the flashlight and popped the passenger door. Mia unbuckled her seatbelt. We'll go together. We stumbled out of the RV on the passenger side. It was like stepping into hell. Countless, lifeless faces stared out at us from the darkness. The only light came from the headlights of the RV and my flashlight. We clumsily made our way along the side of the RV. The ground was littered with mannequin pieces. I thought to myself, if we could get a couple yards cleared out behind the rear tires, we might be able to back out and get enough momentum to reverse all the way back out of here. Instead, when we got to the back of the RV, my stomach flipped and my heart sank. I was expecting to see a trail of flattened mannequins. Instead, the RV was now surrounded by thousands of perfectly intact mannequins, standing at attention, as if their ranks had somehow been replenished after our vehicular assault. This is impossible. She started to cry. I held her close. We'll keep moving, I said. It will never end. The tunnel makes no sense. It only curves one direction. I looked at her. What do you mean? Well, this whole time, the tunnel has only been curving to the right. It would sometimes straighten out or go left a few yards, but before too long, we were curving to the right again. We're either driving in circles or... spiraling... Downwards. So we'll go back the way we came and hope we're not going in circles, I said. We had been driving for hours at this point. Walking back out the way we came would take days. But now that I thought about it, Mia was right. We'd only been curving to the right. This tunnel seemed to be very gradually taking us downwards into the earth. Going forward would not get us any closer to escape. We'll need food from the RV. Mia said. I nodded and we stumbled our way back to the front of the RV, the mannequin's lifeless faces watching us the whole time. I stepped up to the passenger door and nearly fell back when I looked through the window. What the fuck? I breathed. What I saw were two mannequins sitting in the driver's and passenger seat. How they got in there? I have no idea. But what really made my blood run cold was that they were dressed exactly like Mia and I. They wore identical sets of clothes. The one on the passenger seat had my same New Order t-shirt and black jeans. The one on the driver's seat had Mia's green striped sweater and denim shorts. Their plastic faces stared out through the shattered windshield at the endless crowd of mannequins staring back at them. Mia stepped up and saw the uncanny display. What the fuck? Mia echoed. I pulled myself up into the RV and slowly stepped around my mannequin doppelganger. I avoided looking into its face, but... I swear I could feel it watching me as I stumbled around it. Mia followed and we made our way into the back of our dark RV. Luckily, we had just stocked our cooler full of deli meat and water not long after crossing the Colorado state line. I handed Mia the flashlight and pulled open the cooler. I filled a backpack full of food and water. I turned and saw them. My mannequin double had somehow moved. It was standing in the aisle watching us. Mia's doppelganger was still seated in the driver's seat but it turned to peer back at us with its eyeless gaze. Mia saw the look in my eyes and turned. She screamed when she saw them and backed into me. I put my arm around her and we stood there a moment. 
letting our skyrocketing heart rates return to Earth. Let's get out of here, I said. I slid the backpack onto my shoulders. Mia joined me at the door. I looked into her eyes. Are you ready? She nodded. I kissed her. I love you, I said. I love you. She said. The look on her face killed me. She was terrified. I'm sure the look on my face was similar. I opened the door and we stepped out. We again stumbled to the back of the RV. Once we were clear of the RV and all the crushed mannequin body parts, it became easier to find footing. Though weaving through an endless crowd of lifeless people was a slow process. It was pitch black. Without the flashlight, we wouldn't be able to see a foot in front of us. As I walked, the beam of light created the illusion of movement in the crowd. At least I hoped it was an illusion. The limbs of the mannequins seemed to stretch and turn, but the only sound was that of Mia and I shuffling our way through the crowded tunnel. Things went on like this for what felt like hours. Mia and I were sweating and aching. I was about to suggest we stop and rest, but then I saw it and I froze. Out in the crowd, beyond rows of blank faces, I saw a pale face, black hair, and a dead smile. I saw two vacuous eyes staring right at me. Mia, do you see her? I whispered. See who? I slowly raised my arm and pointed. It was the woman, or whatever it was, that stared back at me through the skylight on the roof of the RV. Oh my god! Mia squeaked. I could see now that the pale-faced woman was tall, a few inches taller than the mannequins. As I pointed, she stared back at me with that terrible grin. What do we do? Mia whispered. I raised the flashlight and pointed it right at the pale-faced woman. I thought maybe this would scare her off. I was wrong. The light only made her appear more unsettling as she stared back, unflinchingly. What do you want? I yelled. She only stared back at me. She was as still as the mannequins. We have to keep going, I whispered. Mia didn't respond. Her body was tense as she held on to me. We've come this far. We can't turn back again, I continued. I pulled Mia's hand and we continued on our way through the mannequins, keeping the distance between us and her as wide as possible. As we moved past, she kept watching us. Though our movements were imperceptible to us, her eyes never left us, like one of those portraits whose eyes appear to watch you no matter where you stand. Finally, we got far enough that she was out of sight, but the thought of her being somewhere behind us only unsettled me further and I quickened our pace. As the hours wore on, there was no sign of the pale-faced woman, and the crowd of mannequins began to thin out. They still populated the tunnel from one end to the other, but there was more space between them, allowing Mia and I to walk more freely. The mannequins on the maintenance walkway on the side of the tunnel seemed to thin out as well, and I decided it would give us a better vantage if we were walking up there. I helped Mia climb up the railing that bordered the walkway, then I climbed up behind her. The walkway was elevated three or four feet above the roadway, we could easily see over the heads of the mannequins in both directions. There was, of course, no end to the tunnel in sight. We kept walking. The mannequins continued to thin out, but they were different now. There were mannequins dressed as maintenance workers again, but also mannequins dressed as families and businessmen. There was even a group of mannequin nuns standing in a single file line, heads bowed in prayer. Needless to say, we passed none of this on the way into the tunnel. I was feeling very hopeless that we were going to be able to find our way out. I was far beyond speculating how this was all possible. It's not possible. And even if it were, there was no good reason for someone to do this to us. The only explanation was the supernatural. But then I saw her. Rather, I saw them. Arranged in the middle of the tunnel was a circle of mannequins with long black hair and tattered cloth. They looked exactly like the pale-faced woman, minus any facial features. I kept a close watch on them as we passed to make sure they didn't start following us. A door! Mia shouted. Mia pointed a few paces ahead of her. There was a door leading into the wall of the tunnel. We ran towards it. Mia grabbed the handle, turned it, and pulled. It was heavy, and Mia had to brace her foot on the wall to get it moving. The metal door groaned as if it hadn't been opened in years. Finally, it was open enough to see past. It was a hallway. It went out about five yards, then turned right at a 90-degree angle. The strangest part 
was the design of the hallway. It wasn't cement or pavement like the tunnel. The walls were wood panelled, and the floor was covered in a thick carpet, like a house from the 1970s. I say we see where this takes us, Mia said. There was no reason to disagree, but I wasn't going to get us trapped in there. I opened up my backpack and took out a water bottle. I opened it and handed it to Mia. She drank half, then I drank the other half. I slowly closed the door, shoving the empty water bottle in the crack to keep it from closing all the way. I turned to Mia. Okay, let's go. We slowly made our way down the quiet hallway. We got down to where the hallway corner to the right, and that's when we heard it. Good young. I whipped around. The door had closed behind us. I ran back to it and tried to push it open, but it was no use. There was no way it closed on its own. Someone had to have removed the water bottle. Our path had been chosen for us. There was no turning back. We continued down the hallway. We turned right. The hallway continued, then turned right again. That should have led us right back to the tunnel. But it didn't. This part of the hallway went on far longer than was possible without running into the tunnel. Then it turned right again. It went on like this. Sometimes a section of the hallway was 20 feet long, sometimes it was 20 yards long. Sometimes it was 3 feet long. But it always turned to the right. At first it was a relief to be somewhere other than the cold, dark tunnel. But the hallway very quickly became claustrophobic and before too long, I heard someone walking behind us. We had stopped to take a break, and I heard a third pair of footsteps on the carpet coming from behind us. I backtracked to the last corner. I was terrified as I slowly peeked around the corner, tense and waiting to see the vacuous eyes and inky black hair of the pale-faced woman. But there was nothing there. I wasn't about to backtrack any further. There was no one there, I whispered. Mia slumped against the wall and slid down to the carpet. I think I need some rest, she said. I put my backpack down on the ground for Mia to use as a pillow. She laid her head down and was passed out in seconds. I had no idea how long we had been walking at this point. I stood leaning against the wall. My body was telling me to rest, but I couldn't risk falling asleep. I had to keep watch. I knew she was following us. I took in the details of the hallway for the first time. The carpet was a dull brown, and the walls a cheap wood paneling. The hanging lighting fixtures were shaded by stained glass, something you might see in an old diner. Who built this place? Did someone pick out the carpet and the lighting fixtures? Did a team of workers blast these tunnels into the earth? Or has this place always existed? Was this purgatory? I began to feel dizzy. I was panicking. My heart felt like it was trying to escape my chest. I slumped to the floor and tried to slow my breathing. I closed my eyes. I shot up in panic. I'd fallen asleep while I was meant to be keeping watch. I snapped to my feet and looked around. Mia was still asleep on my backpack. Then I noticed that the hallway had changed. A few paces away, there was now a plain wooden door in the wall. I slowly approached it. I put my ear to the door, and I could hear what sounded like TV static and the low murmur of voices. I discreetly grabbed the door handle and turned it slowly. I felt the latch bolt clear, and I carefully cracked the door just enough to peek inside. It was dark, so it took a second for me to register what I was seeing. I saw a small boardroom. A long table in the center was surrounded by seated men in suits. At the end of the table stood another man next to an old CRT TV that was playing static. This was the only source of light in the room, and all the men around the table were turned towards the TV. Suddenly the screen flickered from static to a solid dark background, and some warped New Age style music began playing. Then the words appeared on the screen that terrified me like nothing else before. In plain text the words read, you will lose her. I froze, as I knew these words were meant for me. I watched with terror as the men seated around the table slowly turned towards me in unison. They were mannequins. The TV screen then clicked off and they continued staring at me as I could barely make out their forms through the near pitch darkness. I quickly pulled the door shut and whipped around to look at Mia. I had a horrible feeling of dread that when I turned around she would be gone, like the message on the TV promised. Eric? What are you doing? Mia was leaning up and staring at me. Thank God. There was Mia, right where I left her. 
pointed at the door and said, This door appeared and I... What door? She interrupted. I turned and, sure enough, the door was now gone. I explained what happened to her, but I left out the message that appeared on the screen. You will lose her. Those words still burned in my brain. I tried to force them out. We drank water, ate granola, and then got moving again. Always. Endless hallways. After a couple hours of walking, we started to hear music. There were small speakers in the corners of the ceiling. I recognized it as the same New Age music that played on the TV in the boardroom. The melody drilled into our minds. Combined with the dull aesthetics of the quiet hallways and the endless right turns, the music had a hypnotizing effect. The lengths of the halls became more uniform. That is to say, the straight section of hallway was about seven paces, then a right turn, then seven paces, and a right turn. I think we're walking in circles. Or a square. Mia said. I looked at her and took out a bottle of water. I peeled off the plastic label and dropped it on the floor. Then we kept walking. Seven paces, right turn. Seven paces, right turn. Seven paces, right turn. And there it was. Mia was right. The label from my water bottle lay in the middle of the hallway. Somehow we had been led into a loop. I lost it. Fuck! I kicked the wall repeatedly and screamed. Mia just leaned her back against the wall. This was our dynamic. If one of us lost it, the other became zen and thought of a solution. More often than not, I was the one to lose it. I finally stopped freaking out. There has to be a way out. A door. Mia said. <sighs> we would have seen it, I replied. A hidden door, she said. She turned around and ran her hands along the cracks of the wood paneling. Most likely on the outer wall, she said. She beat her fist on the wall, listening for a change in the sound. I exhaled heavily, sweating and tired, and I started searching the wall as well. We checked the whole first wall. Nothing. We checked the second wall. Nothing. The third. Nothing. The final wall. Nothing. I gave up and slumped on the floor. Mia immediately went over to the other side of the hall and started checking the inner wall. What are you doing? I thought you said it would be on the outer wall, I asked. Then we heard it. Mia beat the wall and instead of the dead thud, we heard a resonant boom. A door. I shot up and started tapping the wall with Mia until we found where the door ended. It was the width of about four wooden panels. I lined myself up in the center, lowered my shoulder, and pushed. It moved! It barely moved, but it was enough to confirm this actually was a door. I re-centered and tried again, lowering my center of gravity. I pushed as hard as I could. The door pushed inward about three inches. Then Mia joined in. We slowly moved the door. Five inches, then ten, then fifteen, then twenty. Then Mia slipped inside. I had a moment of panic as she disappeared into the darkness, and those haunting words came back into my mind. You will lose her. I darted past the doorway, falling through the threshold and hitting the concrete floor. I looked up and there was Mia. Thank God. I promised myself I'd never let her out of my sight again. The exit, Mia said. She looked and sounded as if she were a thousand miles away. I got to my feet and followed her gaze. What I saw nearly brought me to tears. We were back in the tunnel, but there was light. About a mile down was the mouth of the tunnel, and daylight pouring in. Beautiful daylight. I grabbed Mia tight and kissed her. Thank God! She cried. We started moving. Nothing was going to slow us down this time. We sped up into a run down the maintenance walkway towards that beautiful sunlight. As we approached, something else came into view. Parked in the middle of the roadway was a large vehicle. It couldn't be. It was! Our RV sat in the road waiting for us. We ran all the way to it, pulled open the passenger side door and climbed in. There were no mannequins to be seen. I fell into the driver's seat and Mia handed me the keys. I turned over the engine, the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard. I shifted into gear and floored it towards the sunlight. As we got closer, I could see the green of trees and the blue of the sky. We were maybe 100 yards away. I turned to Mia, tears in my eyes. What I saw turned my blood to ice.
just beyond Mia's window. That horrifying, pale face grinned at me. The pale-faced woman was somehow floating outside of the RV. Before I could say anything, her hand smashed through the window and gripped Mia by the throat. Then in one horrible motion, the thing pulled Mia screaming through the window and... disappeared. I slammed on the brakes just as the RV passed through the exit of the tunnel, and sunlight flooded the cab of the RV. I threw it in park and shot out the door screaming, Mia! Mia! I screamed over and over. I rounded the front of the RV and looked back at the tunnel. What I saw shattered my mind. The tunnel was gone. There was only open road. I had lost her. And that was, we were driving cross country when we entered a tunnel. Do not try to find it. By do not look for door. Great name. This story had it all. It had everything that really just kind of horrifies me about a story. Mannequins, I mean, for those of you that may or may not know me well enough by now, hate mannequins, can't stand them. Ever since I played Condemned Criminal Origins, back when I was, like, much younger, on the original Xbox, yeah, no. Fuck mannequins. So, um, so it's got, it's got plenty of creepy-ass mannequins, which uh, potentially could or could not have been people before. Definitely hard to tell, but very interesting premise. You've got crazy dark tunnel where it's like, you know, it's, it's a claustrophobic, insane situation when you really think about it. You're, you don't, you've, you've got only two directions really to go. And, and it's kind of forced you in this, in this horrific way of like, it's pure darkness. There's more and more mannequins appearing. There's also a, a, a pale faced woman with creepy beady eyes and a big Cheshire cat smile. And who knows what she can do. My, my guess is she's obviously some kind of a horrific entity demon thing. Who, who, is, who is turning people into mannequins. That's my initial guess, right? But no matter what, she's creepy as hell. She's so creepy as hell. She must have a control over the mannequins or something, because it's, it's, it's just nuts. It's just nuts. It's so awesome. It's so creepy. Oh, this story is so good. It's got, it's got elements that make me think of the back rooms. It's got, it's got a moment where it makes me think of, like, P.T., the Silent Hills thing. So many awesome moments in the story. So many great, weird little connections and strange oddities and just things that keep making you question what the hell is going on. This story's great. This story's so, so great. So great. I'm so glad we got to read it. And I'm also very glad that Jenny offered her her services to be uh, to be me in this story. I thought that'd be really good since we're a couple. It kind of worked out really well mentally. I thought it was, I thought it was a really good idea for it. So, uh, so thank you again, Jenny. Uh, if you'd like to support her, I'll pop down some of her uh, some of her socials down below, and you can, you can go give support for her. It's a good idea. Good idea. Ah, oh, rant over, rant over. What what a story! What a story! God, is Pike Tunnel the longest traffic tunnel in the nation? I'm gonna have to have a look at that now. That's interesting. If it is, very creepy. But I suppose if it goes through the Rockies, yeah, I could see that then. I could see that. Pretty big, isn't it? Big, big mountain range. Hmm. I'm going to trust it, but I'm still going to look into it at one point, because that's creepy. That's so creepy. Anyway, I have been Nate at night, and I have really enjoyed myself, and I sure hope you have too. We'll see you for whatever's next. Take care. Thank you so much to my YouTube members and Patreon members for all the love and support. It's thanks to people like you that we can keep growing.